Good evening and welcome back to the shop. I'm excited to go ahead into a, a wonderful evening talking about routers. I'm actually going to share with you some advanced router techniques. So this is not for basics. I'll talk about a very few fundamentals. Then we're going out there to some wild techniques. Well, not that wild, but you know, in the router world. So with a router, you've got two basic kinds of routers. I'm sorry, I only have plunge routers with me right now. And a plunge router if you want to look right in here, operates on these posts and you're able to start the router and while the router is spinning and the power is on, plunge into the work. It also allows you to easily adjust. Usually they have a micro adjuster. This one has one here to adjust the depth of the piece more easily than a fixed router. Now, the fixed router is usually, you're gonna find a cylinder with a casing over it, and you have to manually adjust, you know, turn it off, manually adjust it, set the depth, and then the router bit is proud of the base by whatever it is. You don't plunge it while it's in action. You're stuck with that and it's usually just for cutting edge details, not for making a center cut. Typically, most edge details are cut using a profile router bit. Let's see if I can get a couple of versions here. With a bearing on there. So this is a 5 8 round over and it's got a bearing which is set so that it'll be flush right at the bottom of that round over. Here we have a 5 8 cove cutter, which also has a bearing that would make it equal. So if I, I could actually use these two cutters to make a cove and bead. See, that would fit really nicely. I'm, I'm sorry, not a cove and bead. A, uh, like you could almost make a rule joint if you wanted to do a tilt top table. I'm, I mean a, uh, uh, a drop leaf table you could have a joint like that. Anyway, not to get too into that, but a lot of router bits will come with a bearing and it's there for you to use. Now you don't need the bearing if you're using it in a router table where you can just cover the bearing and use the fence and doesn't matter. But sometimes in your work, you want, you've got a, hard, a difficult situation where you can't use the bearing on the router bit and you don't have the right kind of fence, say, for your router. Um, I meant to dig this out, but I don't have it at the moment. But just trust me on this. The uh, router, this one, comes with an auxiliary fence, which has two posts that come in here and you can adjust that fence to make cuts. But what if you don't? What if you want to make your own fence? What if you don't have the right bit with the bearing giving you the proper offset? I have another bit here that I use a lot, a rabbiting bit, and it comes with all different kinds of bearings so that you can cut whatever kind of offset you like. You like this bit? And here's another bearing that will give you a different size. And this one's set up right now to cut about a, a quarter inch depth cut. But what if you don't have one of these and you want to make a set cut on a curved piece of work? So here's an example of something I showed numerous weeks ago, but I was just showing how to cut this edge relief for this banding, this ebony banding. And I like to put a 332nd banding in there, like a 332nd thick by 332nd deep. This is a little oversized. It needs to be, by the time it's flushed up, it will look lighter and thinner than that. But I want to do that and rather than fixing this whole bit up, what if I just had a straight cutter and I wanted to put that 332nd by 332nd groove right in here? Well, let me show you what you can do. Super easy. You can make a custom fence for this 
piece. So I'm going to just take the router. I'm going to use this little guy here and set my little square flush with the table. Okay. Now I can, let me use the other side where I have 30 seconds. Okay. Then I already set the depth of that bit to 330 seconds. Okay. So I didn't want to bother with that. That's set. Now I want to set a fence that's going to let me cut 330 seconds deep, but on a curved surface. So all we have to do for that is take a piece of plywood. This is going to be our fence. And we're just going to take a pencil, just lay it on there, lay it on the curb. This is my radius, so I forget what that radius is. So we're going to set it up like this and make a line. Now we'll go over the bandsaw and cut that out. Now we'll just take some sandpaper and just soften that up. Just clean up those bandsaw marks that way. And break the edges so we don't cut into the work. Because this is our fence. So now if we look at it, we've got a nice fit right on there and it moves right along beautifully on our fence. So that's what we're going to use instead of any kind of bearing if we don't have one. So this works for any shape of bit if you want to fit it out. Now this is a 5 16 wide bit here. Now I need to bury the bit in the fence, this little fence I made, so I have to cut a notch in there to accommodate the bit. So let's just sight the, we're just going to eyeball the center. That's the pencil that no longer works. So that's about the center and I'm going to go, this is a 5 16 wide bit. So let's go slightly more than that and then we need to go a good, we have to go more than a quarter. All right, so let's go to the bandsaw, just notch that out. Now we've got the bit, the depth set right there. Now we want to measure from our fence our 330 seconds coming this way. Okay, that looks pretty darn good. Okay, so I'm just putting that tape there to indicate where I want it when I do it down. Okay, so that's showing me just right. Now here's something that's a great asset in the shop and that is double stick tape. So you use this a lot in cases where you just want to temporarily hold something on the base. You can't really clamp it. It's not worth screwing it on there. And this carpet tape works amazingly well for holding anything on that you just need a temporary good hold to. So we're just going to take our template. So this is definitely the side I want to put the tape on. And let's just put a little piece right here and get our scalpel. And then we'll flip around. That wasn't very good surgery. And get it over here. Okay. So once I get the tape off. I'm going to set the bit here and now I'm just going to eyeball it to center it and then get it right to my tape. I know that's where I want it and drop it in. There we go. And then press it. Make sure we can spin freely. That's pretty good. Double check the depth. 
close it's a little deeper but i don't care it's gonna be fine we'll go a touch deeper for this one all right so there we are now we just take this tape off and we're set to go we've got a custom made fence to ride on a curve like this so this will work great on a round table now one of the advantages of doing this is when you don't have a round table if you just had a uh, demi loon say it's going around a lot of times with bearing bits you'll know what i mean when this happens sometimes you get to the end where you mean to just stop you don't want to go across the back and the bearing will slip and go around the corner a little bit and take a bite in the back so you wanted a nice clean exit there you didn't want to circle around the back that can happen more well quite easily with a bearing because it's rolling and it just wants to roll around the corner when it gets there this style gives you full support so when you get to the corner it just it's still on there and it's holding really well one thing i do sometimes to make sure that uh, double stick is really stuck is you can put a temporary pressure like this if i just squeeze it tight it's like that that just really locks it in uh, now one thing you need in the shop if you're going to use double stick tape is you need a good general purpose adhesive clean, cleaner <laughs> like this or goo gone or whatever because it's a pain when that gummy residue from the double stick tape is going to sometimes stay on the bottom of your router when you do want to remove it so i'm going to go climb cut because it's a very light cut and it'll leave a little cleaner look even though this is for demonstration we don't fool around here we go. Clean as a whistle. Now that's not a rabbit cutting bit. That's a 5 16 straight cutting bit, but it was easily set up to make a beautiful, accurate rabbit, 330 seconds deep this way and 330 seconds this way. So we've, we've got our recess all cut to make the same kind of groove as we've got here. All right, so that's one way you can modify and change up your router. And the next few are going to be all about curves because that's one of the challenging things that you get into where you have to run shapes on curves and you're trying to accommodate the router to be able to help you with that. Here's the way I've laminated drawers, drawer fronts in the past. Uh, this is just a piece of multi-layered cherry and it's got it was bent and laminated over a form to make a drawer front. So using a urea formaldehyde type glue, the seams are just like glass. So it's really solid and it stays in position nicely. But it's, it takes time and it's a little costly to do. And I usually do that when I'm making a solid drawer front. But there are times when we have used the segmented method, and I showed this in a Shop Night Live some time ago, where we brick laid a drawer front. So you can see kind of the brick laying here. This one was done with poplar, but I really like doing them out of uh, white pine. That was very typical traditionally. The core would be white pine, and then it would be veneered front and back with veneer. I'm sorry, with veneer, yeah. Of course it is. 
<laughs> so it'd be veneered front and back. And then I have done them like this before. And one of the problems that you find is if you just run right on out with the core material here, you see the lighter colored core in the dovetail pins. So by adding the last few bricks on the end with the color, same type of wood that you're using for your project, you'll get, it'll appear to be solid and uh, you'll have your dark pins coming out on the end. So when you brick lay like this, you get some unevenness with the bricks and you say you want to true it up to be absolutely true to the the front edges of your drawer dividers that are already in your chest of drawers because you're going to build a drawer out of this so you want to true it up to a nice curve before you do so now you can just band saw it to a line and then do a lot of fussing and try to line it up right you might have some su success there but if you're doing a whole chest of drawers it has been worth it in the past I have found to make a jig and use your router to create a beautiful smooth arc. Here's an example. Now I've modified this a little because I want to show you with a short one. This is this is a jig that I made for um, a bow front chest of drawers that I did not too long ago, maybe I don't know, four or five years ago, with that method of white pine, white pine in the core and then uh, veneering on the sides. So with that method, I had all those parts, but I had the chest of drawers built. And this curvature here was the radius of the drawer fronts. I mean, the, uh, the drawer dividers. So I just wanted to skim along just a little less than that to create my drawer fronts. So. What I did was I made this support and I put these little support blocks here and rested the drawer fronts in there and used a router on top of these rails and was able to use the rails as a guide to route on the face of the drawer front. Now I had this screwed to a, a plate. These are reference flush with this end. So I could just remove those screws quickly and move them out to any width drawer. Because I did have graduated drawers. They were larger on the bottom and got narrower, so I just unscrewed that one. Keeping this end flush, and I knew that the two curves were identical because these were cut off the same reference. So I'm going to just show you doing this with a small, this small drawer front. And I modified, I put some blocks in here. These initial blocks are just to hold it below the surface here but support it so it doesn't move around when it's being routed so i just put these temporary blocks in here that will just cradle that piece and hold it at whatever height i don't even care if it rocks a tiny bit like it is right now just subtly because i'm going to fix it in there and we're going to create our front and then do the inside after so i'm just going to put a clamp right on here to really squeeze that in there and don't let it move. I'll put another one on the other end. I'll put it down far enough so I don't obstruct the router when we're coming through. Okay, so there. That whole top is below the surface. So now we want to modify the router to make this arc. So I'm just going to put this on here. I'm going to use this router this time. So what you run into a problem, especially with wider drawers, that when you get across the expanse, your plate, unless you have a wide plate, is not held. So you've got to put some outriggers on your router base to let it carry across the arc. All right, so what I'm going to do is use these two rails and once again, we're going to employ our good friend, the double stick tape, which, by the way, you can get at most home centers or hardware stores. It's carpet tape, all right? It's kind of the mesh kind. 
There is a foam backed, but I don't really prefer that. All right, so there we go. <laughs> I just want to bring that right about there. And I'm going to set this up next to that router bit, okay? So I'm going to come in like this, get as close as I can. And I'm using for this routing, I'm going to use a dovetail bit because that shearing angle of the cutter, it's kind of an experiment because this really is just a demo piece, but it might end up being something and I'll use it. But I want to see the quality of the cut with a shearing router bit when you're skimming along. And it's three quarters inch wide, so it's going to clean it up pretty fast. All right, so let's just set our pieces here. Now I'll just come under here. I'm going to make a little pen mark there. I'll make one over here as well. Okay, hopefully I got, yes I did. Okay, now I will just put a little carpet tape on here. And this is just to hold these rails on here, so I don't need a ton. Oh, let's see. Let me do this fast. Do it up here so you can see it. Uh, where is my... While you're doing this, what are your tips on controlling the router when you cut a cr the cross grain on a round tabletop without tearing the wood? Ooh, good question. Sometimes when you're on a round tabletop and you've got to route the edge, what this question is referring to is on two quadrants, you're going, the router bit is going to be spinning into the grain of the top. And there's really no way of going around that. So that router bit is going to be spinning that way. So there's a number of things. Number one, take light cuts. So don't try to go all the way to the bottom the first cut. You want to, you want to go light with it. Uh, numerous cuts and then save the last one for a light cut. Now if you can leave just like a sixteenth or so for the end or lighter, then you can use, usually you can use a climb cut for that where you're going with the spin. So you, usually you want to always pull against the spin so that you're controlling the router. If the router is turning clockwise as you look down on it and you're cutting like say with the router to the left of the workpiece, so you're going to be always pulling. If I pushed in that case, then I would be moving the router with the spin, and if you're taking a big bite, it wants to jump. And that's a little scary when it happens, but you don't want to do that with your final pass. It'll leave a cleaner cut if you can climb cut. But if you leave only a small amount of material, you could climb cut on that scary area. The obvious method, um, the most obvious I think, is use a sharp cutter. They, you're going to have better success there as well and you want to have it on a good speed. Um, let me see, I don't want to forget, there are other methods. Um, and one of the other ways is you can actually wet the grain. When you get it close, just take a rag and wet that grain. The softening of the fibers when you wet it, you, this works with planing too, like when, you, when you're planing uh, highly figured wood and you don't want to get tear out on that last pass, you can dampen the surface. That water goes in, it's not going in a lot of hurting anything, but it'll penetrate the fibers enough that it'll soften and relax them a little, making them less likely to pull and tear out. So. All those tips, I think, light cuts, sharp blades, uh, go slow, and climb cut, if possible, wet when you can. All those kind of things. I'm probably forgetting something, but that's in general what you can do. Um, let me, so I've got this on here. Now, I've just eyeballed those parallel, and I put a general center line. So these are now created, I modified, my router to give me these two rails outriggers. There we go. Now I can plunge 
until I hit that board top. Now, before I plunge, let me bring it up a little bit and just show you, this is how it's gonna just carry along my curved rail. So I'm gonna get, translate that curve. Now, if I plunge a lot and went a lot deeper, I'm actually cutting a smaller radius than my outside piece. If you're gonna do that, you might wanna even calculate for absolute accuracy, this radius would be a quarter inch larger, say, than my drawer dividers. If I'm gonna plunge a quarter inch, then I'll end up making this drawer front exactly the same. So let's just do a little bit of this and see what happens. All right, what I'm gonna do, I, want, I can't control exactly the depth that I'm going, so I'm gonna go till I just hit the material. And let's just do it right here, all right? So this is generally where I'm hitting. So I'm gonna bring my depth down and then that's right, it's zeroed out. So now I'm gonna raise my depth stop by just, let's just go maybe an eighth of an inch. Not even, and so that I'll plunge and I'll be skimming about that depth. Here we go. And look at that, we've got a beautiful radius piece. I know this is almost identical to that. So that would be just, I would just uh, card scrape or sand that, and I would have the perfect radius because I was guided by these rails. Then I could take it to the bandsaw and set this nice clean piece on the fence. And let's say I wanted a three quarter inch drawer front to set my, my blade to three quarter and just run it right in through, keeping pressure right against, right next to the teeth of the saw, making sure I'm staying right on there as I move it through. And I'll end up with a nice parallel cut in the back. Some of you might have done, who have done the rocking chair, the craftsman style rocking chair, we had a curved arm on there and we used a similar method to scoop the underside of our curved arm, so it would mate perfectly with the support rail. And we got a beautiful fit by just using a box similar to this, because we had a wide arm on there like this, and we had a, a really nice smooth surface underneath. So that works well for that. So there you go. Another method for souping up and getting more out of your router just by adding extension arms. Now, we've gone kind of crazy with this method a number of times in the custom work I've done. And sometimes you have to go over a wide expanse. And I can't even explain to you the exact job because it was this wide desk apron that had these swooping curves. And I found this, this is the rail that we use for that project. So we just had a singular hole. You don't need two rails side by side 
for this one, we, we just drilled a hole in a piece of Purple Heart that was dead straight. And the reason we wanted something like this is this is super rigid and we didn't want any flex in it as it was going out because we wanted a singular piece. Then the bottom side of this is actually has a slight radius because it was following a curve like this when I was routing. And so it needed an outrigger this far to follow the rails. It was for this desk that had this inward curve on the side. So it went and we did it that way. So that's a way you can just max out your radius and really get like a sculptural quality out of your router. Instead of just these little profiles, you're gonna get some sculpting action from it. So I wanna show you a dilemma that I had where I had to really think about how to use this method with the, with the runners to create kind of an interesting thing. Now, let me just show you the design that I was after. This is um, a pier table that I made in the 18th century style a few times. Later on, I wanted to make it in a little different style. So here's the top. See that shape, that lobed shape on the side with an apron top. Now, this was like when I was transitioning this table to a more contemporary look. So the top was doing this contemporary thing that I was into starting to explore more and it was kind of an art art deco look so i have an amboyna burl on there and it was kind of red unusually red most of these amboyna burl uh, flitches tend to be golden brown and a beautiful color but this had more of a reddish tinge the base though if you look at it and you're aware of traditional furniture that's a classic kind of like Fife base, uh, that, but that was a, a period style, like 18th century, early 1800s style base that was hand carved. And I actually used that on some other ones. So what I didn't like about this the first time I made it, I just did that because I had this mahogany base already carved and I souped up the top, but I just decided I would ebonize the base. And rather than using brass feet I had them uh, nickel plated so these were glossy hard nickel plated and just having that kind of uh, chrome look to them pushed them to a, a surprising effect with the ebonized leg so it was kind of like a made it feel a little more contemporary but but stylistically it's 18th century and it really was out of place with the Art Deco top and the feet. So came time, I got an opportunity to make another table like this. Someone wanted one, I said, yes, I'll do it. I said, but I'm not, I want to modify the base and make it a little more uh, contemporary, a little more Art Deco feeling, yet still retaining some of this. Now, unfortunately, I do not have the picture. I wish I did, but I dug through the library and I found, the actual drawing that I made of this base. So I want you to see, this is the top. Instead of that turn column, I had a block here with like square mm, it's legs. It's hard to see, Tom, just so you know. What? It's hard to see on the screen. Okay. Can you, anyone see the lines? I think they can see it. Okay, I just want so you know. mainly to see the column. Here's the legs, the wheels, and then this all got veneered. I'll show you a picture of it soon enough. But here's the the challenge okay I have this pedestal base and I wanted this to have a subtle curve coming up and then I'm not showing you the profile but it was not as thick in profile there were four legs and they were coming out at kind of oblique angles I think it was like 25 degrees off and then those two in the back so from the side view it was a softer curve this is a little stronger curve okay so using what we just went over with our outriggers. I'm gonna set this aside because you, you can see what we were going for. Almost like a, um, oh, obelisk type appearance, but with curvature, okay? So that subtle curve. So to pull that off, some of you are probably already on it. 
I needed a box. I needed a box, but a box with curved sides. And if I could figure a way to mount the block inside this box, which these two end pieces are, these actually were referenced in the center and screwed to the center of that block, front and back. And this is the profile that I just showed you. So that's that curve that we were looking at. So if I could rig up the router, now this one, the tape is coming off, but I, would, I could just cut that curvature this way in the block and then flip it with that center and orient it squarely up and hit the other side, okay? Now the front and back was a little more subtle curve than this, so I decided I would just change out my sides. I've got them over there, but they're just a little softer curve. So basically getting the same thing front to back and creating this rectangle. Now that's all well and good, right? That works fine. But what if you had to go and do one other thing, which I did <laughs> to this, and instead of the sides being flat, they have this curvature, but also concave this way. So almost like the Super Bowl trophy has those curvatures inward. So I wanted that for my router table as well. Now, so rather than just having these sticks, I needed to create a curved base that would ride in the same form. So check it out. I, I figured out the curve, I had it all mapped out and drawn out, and I just made this box. So this is the curvature of, this is the arc that I had it curving in. Here's where the router base would sit. And I, this is set up for the Triton router that I have. It sits right on there. I don't have this set up with a bit, but you'll be able to see the whole thing. The piece would get mounted in the centers. And rather than just going straight back and forth, you have this action. And you're go giving the curvature this way. So these curves were just laid out on the drawing and I just made these templates off the drawing and made these two sides together. And then the same with this radius, it's just looking at it from the plan view to get the curvature I wanted in this radius. So I created that for the sides and then the uh, front and back. Now I did run one, I, and I'm gonna show you what it looks like after it comes out. So this is the way, before I knock the corners off, this is what it creates. Isn't that cool? This is the way the joinery went into the col column. That was cut first. And then these corners are gonna get clipped. And I did that with hand tools actually to match the angle of the legs coming out. I think it's like a 25 degree angle. And that's a more involved. But I just wanted to illustrate to you how you can use your router almost like a CNC machine by just setting up bases and make it, make it custom to whatever you're dreaming. All right, everybody, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Remember, if you like this content, please like, share, and subscribe. On behalf of the camera lady and myself, we look forward to seeing you next time.